Hey, hey guys, welcome back to the Bleeding Grave Podcast, episode Two. dos. <laughs> I am one of your hosts, Hannah. I am your other host, Austin. And we're just a couple of cousins from the Midwest who like to talk about ghost stories and creepy things, and so that's what we're doing. So, Hannah, what's been going on with you? <laughs> um, lots of fun with the RSS feeds. They're... As of the time of recording are currently two listings for the Bleeding Grey podcast on Spotify. Oops. Um, so a lot of emails were sent today. Uh, hopefully by the time this comes out that will all be fixed and it won't affect anything. Thankfully this is happening in the beginning. Yes. Spotify for podcasters seems to be very helpful. Well, that's things. good. So I sent them an email. And I got, like, just the generated email back, but there's a ticket number now, I believe. So, uh, hopefully we'll get it all figured out. Yeah, absolutely. But our trailer episode is out as of last night. Yes, exciting. I've had coworkers coming up to me about it. I've been telling people to listen to it. And just the, the feedback so far, I know it's very few, But even that is a world of difference for what we're doing here. Honestly, yeah, it just feels really good knowing that people are listening and liking it, even if it's not a bunch of people and it's basically just people we know. It still feels really good that those people believe in us and are at least giving it a shot. Hey, as long as they enjoy it. It's very reaffirming. That reaffirming or reassuring? Both. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Both, really, because we're obviously having fun doing this, but Mm -hmm. seeing that people are enjoying it. It just well. makes it a hundred times yeah. better. And that's really the point of doing this. We had a lot of fun just talking about this, like we did usually on long car rides, just late nights while we're playing video games, but we wanted to share it with you because we have a lot of fun with these conversations, and that's the thing, they're conversations, yeah. uh, and we want you to join into the conversation. So on social media, you can reach out to us, tell us what you're thinking and everything yeah. as well, but... We want to know. Uh, you can email us at thebleedinggrave at gmail.com. How are you? I am doing well. I've had some pretty big ups and downs lately. Not going to get a whole lot into it, but I was off all last week, which was really nice. I was supposed to be in Colorado, but at the same time, I did have a, a fun staycation. Also, a new pet is in my life. She is currently sitting on the ledge of our studio. Her name is Ash, and she's enjoying the March evening views. Mm -hmm. But yeah, as of right now, I can't complain. I'm pretty good. Good. Yeah. So, as always, ladies first. Pets. It is tails today. It looks like Mr. Austin here gets to start first. So my topic of conversation today is the story of Carl McCunn. Have you heard of, have you heard of this man? I have not. Okay. All right. So this is the story of Carl McCunn. He was born in Munich, Germany on January 25th, 1947. This is where his father was stationed in the U.S. Army following the World War II events. What's up? Just a little uh, synchronicity between our stories. Uh, he's from Germany. There are German origins to the name of what I'm covering. Okay. Okay. That is very interesting. I love it. Okay. <laughs> so, after his father got out of the uh, out of the army, they moved to San Antonio, Texas, where Carl was raised and graduated high school, 1964. Shortly after high school, he joined the Navy for four years, was discharged in 1969. After being discharged, he found a love of photography... He then moved to Seattle, Washington, and then finally settling in Anchorage, Alaska, where the story takes place. Okay. That was a lot. A little rapid fire information. Yeah. So I just kind of wanted to get through that, set the tone. It takes place in Alaska and more of the northern part, but I'll get into that. Uh, so Carl was no stranger to taking trips into the wild to photograph all the wildlife and the nature, the landscape. He did a regular trip, or or I should say a five-month trip, into the Brooks Range mountain range, and that's in northern Alaska. So he decided to do it again. We fast forward to 1981. He wanted to do another trip just on the base 
of the Brooks Range Mountains, about 220 miles northeast of Fairbanks, Alaska. Uh, just kind of give you some perspective where he is. And he wanted to be by the Porcupine River, and that's where he did set up base camp. So like I said, Carl was no stranger to going on these trips. So he knew what to bring with him. So on this trip, he brought 500 rolls of film, 1,400 pounds of food and water, two rifles and ammo, one shotgun and ammo. To get there, he had to hire a bush pilot as well. And he's hired bush pilots in the past. Never a big deal. So bush pilot takes him out. He arrives at his base camp. Once he arrives at his base camp, he's setting setting up all his, his tent and everything. As he's going through all of his supplies, he decides to throw two big boxes of shotgun shells into the river because he believed he brought too much and it was going to weigh him down. Okay. I'm not 100% sure what his thought process is by being weighed down, but that was his thought process. And Carl did also keep a journal of his day-to-day activities. And, you know, everything was going pretty well for Carl. Uh, He was taking magnificent photos of the scenery, got some great wildlife shots, just enjoying the beauties of the mountains. However, August came, and Carl had a feeling that he made a terrible mistake. He was under the assumption that the bush pilot was going to pick him up in early August. And when the first week of August came around, this is when he started to to, uh, worry just just a little bit. Carl... After realizing this, Carl did write in his journal, and he said, I think I should have used more foresight in arranging my departure. I'll soon find out. Now, from the bush pilot's recollection, a little more backstory information on this. So the bush pilot remembers telling Carl that he might be in Alaska at the end of summer, but he might not since he did fly in other states as well. He does have documentation that Carl paid for the pilot to take him in to where he wanted to go and for any aircraft repairs. But there was no documentation that any form of payment was received for a return trip. So the pilot assumed that Carl had other arrangements to be picked up since there was no payment or any form of communication. Carl had realized this as well. And realizing this, Carl didn't know how long it would be before anyone came looking for him. So he needed to start rationing his food. But luckily, having a rifle and some ammunition, he was able to take up some hunting and try to live off the land. He was doing this to try to save as much of the food that he brought as possible if it were to take longer than a few weeks or months because winter was coming. He was successful in shooting ducks, muskrats, bunnies, squirrels, anything that he could get for food. He also tried shooting at a wolf once and wrote in his diary, he shot, the wolf yipped and ran away, and he wrote, I may live to regret that. There was no other context other than that. Okay. He made another journal log and said, humans are so out of touch with their modern day element in a place like this. I mean, I couldn't imagine living in a place like that. Knowing that no one's potentially coming for you. Yeah, I... That's rough. Mm Mm-hmm. So as winter approached, his food started to dwindle, and Carl was starting to get worried no one was coming for him. He did, however, provide maps of where he'll be to his friends and family, but he didn't leave them an itinerary, so no one knew when Carl was to return. Is this just all one big miscommunication? I mean, it's starting to sound like it, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Carl did... Say to his friends and family not to contact the police if Carl wasn't back by the end of summer. Because in his words, if the trip is going well, I'd want to stay longer. So there's the reason why he didn't give the itinerary. Well, that's stupid. And this is why, like in Minnesota here in the DNR, if you go up to the Boundary Waters, you have to check in every so often. Mm-hmm. So if they, if you say, I'm going to be back this day and there's, it's been an extra day, oh, they're coming looking for you. Oh, 100%. But we also got to remember, this is in the Alaskan bush, too. Mm-hmm. Very, very hard to get in and out of. Yeah. I and mean, so is the Boundary Waters, but I feel like Alaska is going to be yeah. a bit more well, he had to fly. treacherous. But yeah, he had to fly in and then mm-hmm. walk to his base camp. Yeah. So as Carl was getting worried, he wrote down in his journal, certainly someone in town should have figured something must be wrong. Me not being back by now. But then again, there's probably no one in that town that gives a fuck about me. 
what do those people think I gave them my, a map of my location for? Decoration? You can really see he's getting... He's losing it. A little bit. But luckily, his friends came through. And after a few weeks into August, they contacted the Alaskan State Troopers after telling them where Carl was and that he should have been back by now, they immediately set one of their own bush pilots out to his location on the map. Just like on the map, the pilot found where Carl's camp was. So he made a first pass and he saw Carl waving his orange sleeping bag very casually and didn't seem really in distress. On the second pass, the pilot said uh, Carl was waving uh, to the plane very casually. Kind of like, like, hey, how you doing? Yeah. So the pilot was like, hmm, I'm going to make a third pass just in case. And he saw Carl slowly walking back to his tent without signaling the pilot. My first thought with that is that he has probably been trying to fly down pilots for a while. But if they don't know that they're looking for something, Mm -hmm. like they might not have seen him. Right. So he is probably just like trying for the sake of trying at this point. Mm -hmm. He probably doesn't think anything's going to happen. Right. Right? So, Mm -hmm. that's my first thought. He also might be weak. I don't know if he's still got food. Right. And how much ammo he has for hunting and all of that stuff, so. Yeah. Uh, So, with everything seeming all right on the pilot's end, and Carl didn't seem in distress, the pilot turned around and went back to the... That's not what... But that's not what he was supposed to do. He found him. Should he not have landed? And I don't know... Talk to him? Homeboy's been out in the woods for how long? I mean, from the pilot's perspective, it looks like he was giving him, like, hey, I'm good. So, with that being said, I mean, Carl thought with the plane turning around and going back to the station that they were going to get help. But later that night, he started to rethink his interaction with the plane. So, Carl dug up his survival guide and was looking for signals of how to communicate with an aircraft. When he was looking at the signals and realizing what he did, he made the gesture for, all is okay, do not wait. And how that gesture goes is you stand up tall with your hand in the air, really high up, and you hold it there. And from a pilot's distance, even if he's waving, it probably looks like he's just standing there, like, because it's supposed to be stationary. Oh... Mm-hmm. Yeah. If he was only moving his hand or something. Yeah, because in Carl's mind, he was doing it in celebration. Yeah. Of like, hey, you guys found me great. I'm right here. Yeah. You know where I am at. Yeah. So when he realized this, he wrote in his diary, it is my fault I am here now. I am a klutz. Now I know no one is coming. But Carl became lucky and found some snare traps for food to snare rabbits, squirrels, and any small animals out in this climate right now. And it was going quite well for him. It was getting to be late October now, and everything was starting to freeze over. So the nearby lake is starting to freeze over, and the river was starting to freeze over as well, so Carl couldn't adequately get water now. With it becoming colder and colder and food more scarce, he realized that the predators were also getting his food that he was catching in the snares. He'd go to the snare, and there was nothing there. It was sprung, but no no sign of the rabbit. Now, with it being late October in northern Alaska, in the coming weeks, it's going to snow more and more. Like, I think I looked it up, and it was... Like, Alaska can get a couple feet of snow up there at any given time. It sounds ridiculous, but very... No, like that's, yeah, Yeah, absolutely. That that makes sense to me. Right. Being at that high altitude and everything. Mm -hmm. In another journal entry, he says, it's getting colder. My hands become more frostbitten with every passing day. I have one can of beans left. I'm honestly scared for my life, but I won't give up. In late November, Carl caught a squirrel and it wrote in his journal, but that's only a tease, even when chewed up and swallowing all the bones. Like, this man is so hungry and trying to survive that he's eating every single piece of that animal. Could you imagine being that desperate? No, No, I cannot. That's a terrifying thought. That is absolutely terrifying. So around Thanksgiving, Carl wrote another entry. I feel miserable. Waking up chilled the last three days. Can't take much more of this. 
can't stop thinking about using this bullet. I mean, I don't blame him, but I I feel bad for him. Yeah. Over miscommunication, mm-hmm. it it's coming down to. At the end of November, Carl made another entry. I'm using the last of my split wood, and once it grows cold, I too will grow cold. I don't want to go through the chills again. My God. With the weather becoming more and more harsh, Carl's starting to lose hope at this point. With this sense of hopelessness, Carl wrote a letter to whoever finds him to please give all the belongings that are in the tent and at this campsite to his father. Along with this letter is attached another letter describing how to develop the film that of all the pictures he has taken out there. And whoever finds me, please have the two rifles and shotgun as reward for your troubles. Jesus. This is end of November, beginning of December. I can only imagine how harsh it actually is in there. Now back to his friends. They've been trying and reaching out to Alaskan state troopers. Their only one trip with the three passes that they made from August to now almost February, they've been trying that entire time. They only made one trip, three passes. So it's like, you have friends and family that are worried about him. Wouldn't you want to go? Wouldn't you check back in after yeah. like maybe another couple of weeks or another month or something? Right. You, one would think because... He only had so much food. He mm-hmm. was not ever planning on actually staying out there. Would it have been possible? Probably only if he was prepared with the right clothing and all of yeah. that. But he wasn't. He was prepared for summer. Yeah, exactly. Not fall, definitely not winter. Mm-mm. So it's it's like negligence on the Alaskan State Troopers' part, which is it's, Absolutely. It, it's frustrating. So now we'll fast forward to February 2nd, 1982. Carl's friends are extremely worried at this point with how harsh this winter has been. I would be too. And they call the Alaskan State Troopers again. After all this begging and pleading, the Alaskan State Troopers finally sent a team out. A team this time. Finally did their job. Mm -hmm. Sent a team out in a plane, landed a mile or two away. They skied in. And made it to his campsite. I mean, luckily, at the same time, they had the maps to get to him right away. Yeah. So they didn't waste. They're very lucky that they had those. Yeah. So upon arrival at Carl's campsite, they found his tent. And inside his tent, they found a note with his ID, Carl's 100-page diary. And they found Carl in his tent, dead, with a gunshot wound to the head. Carl's last entry... And his journal says, if my body has been eaten on, or if it turns out I've taken my own life, just put me under a tree so I can make a decent meal for a critter. I don't want my family to see me this way. I'm speechless. That gave me chills. It's an, it's an intense story, but it's that's, also a, a good... It's very heavy. It's a good story... That I think they actually teach in survival classes. And you know, like the story Into the Wild? Mm-hmm. Same thing. But Carl's happened before the other guys. I can't remember his name off the top of my head. Yeah. There is no words for that. No, that it's really... it's a very it's a very terrible thing that happened. It's a terrible thing that and... absolutely could have been avoided. Mm-hmm. It was a tough one to read. And there was a there's a documentary on it on Netflix too, under True Mysteries. Okay. No, that was YouTube, sorry. Oh, okay. YouTube. Like a 10-minute little documentary on it. it. was really good. But no, it's a. this is a really good reminder of how harsh the wilderness actually is and can be. Yeah, absolutely. Just the wilderness and everything in general just by nature is very brutal, very harsh. Right. I would say, I mean... Carl survived for probably a lot longer than most people would. Yeah, he had enough knowledge and to an extent supplies to be able to do so. Yeah, I would I would agree. The The knowledge of the wilderness and knowing how to use a, a firearm as well probably helped him out, or did help him out a lot. Yeah, 100%. So they did do an investigation into it, 
But since the uh, Bush pilot did have proper documentation and everything as well, Mm -hmm. he was not held liable, accountable, or anything. No, he couldn't Uh, be. But there was, I believe, a potential uh, investigation into the uh, police work as well. Unfortunately, there isn't a whole lot on what was the outcome of it. But I hope that Carl's family did get some justice they deserve. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, some sort of closure. So, some sort of closure, yeah. So with that, I hope that your story is a little more enjoyable um, and not as dark. I guess I can't say dark, but it's certainly chaotic. Um, well, chaos can be really fun. Yeah. Uh, but thank you for sharing your story. Mm-hmm. Are, are you ready? I am ready. Today, I am going to be covering poltergeists. Ooh. Just in general, the idea of poltergeists, and then I figure in the future I can delve into more specific stories and actually tell the full stories. But I have some examples and things in here from some stories that I thought I would share Okay. as well. But let's start with the word poltergeist. It is made up of two German words, polter meaning racket or noise, and geist meaning spirit. So basically it just means noisy ghost. <laughs> That's an understatement. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Like, <laughs> the movies tell me differently. <laughs> so generally, these spirits are very disruptive and chaotic. They've been known to throw and break things, start fires, be very noisy, and usually act with malicious intent. Their actions are often very repetitive, too. Usually, a poltergeist will pick one member of the family to focus on. This family member is usually a child or a teenager, More often than not, these spirits will make someone their target, and in turn, their family kind of becomes the target of harassment. Sometimes going as far as leaving scratches, bite marks, you know, just physical things, issues, problems. So there's no way to, like, really just, like, summarize their actions aside from that because they're just so across the board. So I figured I'd give some examples. So there is the Danny Poltergeist case. There were many spirits in the Cobb's home and they wrote notes for them. One of the notes was actually inviting the Cobb's family to a party in their living room. Oh. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. I don't know how I feel about that, but... <laughs> yeah. Did... Okay. Okay. <laughs> mm-hmm. Then there was the Portsmouth Poltergeist. When the neighbor across the street uh, would look at the Daughtry's house from her porch, she would see cups and random things just being thrown from the house. And when she and other neighbors would then go and check on the family, they usually found them amongst their things that had been just thrown around in their home, looking relieved that someone had barged in and interrupted. The family said that they couldn't explain what was happening. Well, yeah, if there's things being thrown about and all about. To the point that your neighbors are coming to check on you? Like cups and things just flying out of your windows. Can you imagine? Imagine coming home after a nice dinner and you just, and you know no one's home, mm-hmm. but there's just shit flying everywhere. Or you've everywhere. got the whole family just standing right there by you. Right. Like nobody's like, touching anything. <laughs> like I said, chaotic, disruptive. See, chaos is fun. Chaos is <laughs> fun. I don't know how fun this would actually be in reality, but. And you're probably right. Another one of my favorite things with poltergeists is just, in general, the amount of people that have a poltergeist problem that call the police. (laughs) I'm I'm, I'm sorry. What do you mean? I get it, but... I I get it to an extent, but there are people who will call the police repeatedly. Could you Um, imagine how those calls go? Yeah, there's... I'll tell you how the calls go. Okay, never mind. (laughs) So when the police arrive it goes one of two ways right uh the commotion just completely stops so no one else can witness it okay or the chaos ensues randomly sometimes subtly or just full on but usually so at least one officer will see something Mm. so they're just being cheeky about it they're like hey (laughs) we can do whatever we want and there's nothing you can do about it Here's a little tease. So I have some theories and explanations. The first one, it's all a hoax. Usually attributed to cases where a teenager is the main victim of the spirit. uh, Thought to just be bored kids or attention-seeking kids making things up. I think one of the really notorious stories like that is Jeff the Mongoose. 
which is a poltergeist story. Jeff the Mongoose. I haven't heard Jeff the Mongoose. I'll cover that one. Please do. I will definitely I cover that one. I am giddy with anticipation. I'm fairly certain it's Jeff the Mongoose. If you yeah, lie th- to me. That one's a fun one. It's The story is super fun. But... Okay. I'll believe you. And then there's the underground water theory, which basically just suggests that there's water moving underground and it affects things up here by the vibrations of angst. But this was pretty much disproven when recreated with mechanical vibrations. Huh. And then the last theory, uh, it's ghosts. You know? <laughs> that That's the last theory, is it's ghosts? Like, it might just be ghosts, right? I mean, what else? What? If, if not anything else, then what? <laughs> what was that? Mechanical wavelengths, you said? Mechanical vibrations. But it's just, me- it's just mechanical vibrations. Yeah. That explains everything, right? Well... Well, they recreated the effect or tried to with mechanical vibrations to mimic the vibrations that this underground water creates, and it didn't didn't do nothing. <laughs> like it didn't. It just disproved it. So, so if you, I mean, if they, you they, disprove they, a theory, the how is it still a theory? Well, that's the point. It was a theory. It was basically okay. disproven. But okay. it depends on who you're talking to because it also I would assume depends on kind of what they're looking at when doing these experiments because if they're simply looking at things that are scooching around then i could see why they might think it's that but what about the times where furniture is stacked on top of each other or there was one story i remember hearing about how a parent had gotten up in the middle of the night i think because they heard a commotion or something and they went out in the hallway and their child was sleeping on the floor in the middle of the hallway with their nightstand set on top of them and everything on the nightstand still on top of him and she woke the kid up and was like what and the kid was like i don't know so wait she woke up the kid that was under the nightstand yeah and and the kid didn't know how he got there that's wild yeah like i don't think underground i don't think underground water can do that no no (laughs) i'm not a scientist but i'm not a scientist i can't remember what story that was but yeah okay obviously that one stuck in my mind i mean could you imagine just I don't even know, man. Mm-hmm. It defies all laws of physics as well. Mm-hmm. How does it just... I always wonder, like, how does just a, a ghost or an entity of some kind just be able to pick up a solid object? I mean, also, when they just take things and it disappears. I know Em and Christine talk about this a lot. Like, where does it go? Who Do they, do they put it in their ghost pockets? I want to know because our grandpa Al, he takes stuff from me all the time. In fact, mm-hmm. I'm fairly certain he took my TV remote because there's nowhere I could have lost it currently. Right. He takes stuff from me all the time. Where does he put it? In his little ghost pockets? In his ghost trench coat. His ghost? I don't think he wore trench coats. I want to believe he did. You know who? You know do who you could think solve? Ghosts just come with pockets. Like, do you think they just have pockets? I don't know. I feel like if they do you can think defy they just have, laws like, unlimited of physics, inventory. They could... <laughs> this is an Animal Crossing, Hannah. You don't have unlimited inventory in Animal Crossing, but I'm saying, only you would like, know that. not only me. There's plenty who would know. Regardless, <laughs> I'm just saying. I want to know. I want to know about the ghost pockets. That's it. I think there's only one. Unfortunately, I think there's only one way you're going to find out if there's going to be ghost pockets, and hopefully that it doesn't happen to you for another like 50 years. At least. I guess definitively you're right. I like to think at some point maybe my mediumship will be to a point where they can tell me about the ghost pockets. Using your medium powers to find out if ghosts have pockets. (laughs) (laughs) Why? If not for anything else. so on par with you though. (laughs) I want to understand. Right? Like I think that's fair. I mean, yes. People come to me and they ask me, what's it like over there? What are my loved ones doing? I should be able to tell them about the ghost pockets. Well, we can cover ghost pockets at a later time. I think it's time to wrap it up here today, Hannah. You get that fun fact? Yeah, I've got that fun fact. Awesome. All right. So, the clock. If a clock which has not been working suddenly chimes, there will be a death in the family. You'll have bad luck if you do not stop the clock in the room when a death occurs. You have to stop it from chiming? No. So I, this is actually, it looks like it's actually two facts. Oh. 
So say, yeah, say that yeah, again. Yeah, I'm going to say it S- again. Say it again, yeah. yeah. So if a clock which has not been working suddenly chimes, there will be a death in the family. Alternatively, you will have bad luck if you do not stop the clock in the room where a death occurs, when the death occurs. Oh, okay. So it was two. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, I guess it looks like it's just like it's two separate sentences. It looked like it was just like. Okay. Because the way. <laughs> yeah. Great fact, but it sounded like it was like, as long as you stop the chime, there's no death. Yeah. I'm like, there's a loophole here. <laughs> <laughs> there's always a loophole, Austin. Oh, okay. 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 All right. Well, thanks for listening to this episode of The Bleeding Grave. And we'll see you next time. See you guys. Take Bye. it easy. Bye. The Bleeding Grave Podcast, hosted by Hannah Slavic and Austin Winger. Music by Hannah Slavic. Find us on social media on Facebook and Instagram. And you can listen to us on Spotify, SoundCloud, and YouTube.